Hi everyone. Welcome to Kumbali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, excite, reconnect, and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from the 29th of October through the 8th of November 2020. Kumbali, the Indonesian word for return or come back, represents revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia together with an international audience at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connections is more important than before. Our guest today is Joe Sacco. To those familiar with comics journalism genre, he requires no introduction as he is widely seen as one of the founders of the current generation of the form. His 1991 series, Palestine, opened the door to many others, and he has since broken new ground with his reportage from Sarajevo, Iraq, Uttar Pradesh, and numerous other places around the world. He is a New York Times bestseller, and his work has won many prestigious awards, including some that had not previously recognized graphic novels. This is particularly notable in light of the fact that his lens is decidedly anti-colonial. His most recent book is also about the legacy of colonialism, this time in relation to the Dene First Nations people and current struggles over resource extraction. We welcome by Joe Sacco. And this is where we get a, applause if this was live. <laughs> but, um, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be talking to you and to uh, be speaking to uh, the people at the festival. Thank you. Yes, these are, um, you know, it's sort of strange times all over the world to be doing something like this. Um, you know, you're in Portland, I'm in Oakland, California, Ohlone land. Um, normally this, I think the audience is going to be a lot of people from around the world. Um, when I've been to the Ubud Writers Festival, it's a lot of people from Australia um, and a lot of Indonesians. One of the things that for me has been the most rewarding about having been able to come to the Ubud Writers Festival is meeting all the cutting edge, risk-taking literature and activist artists in Indonesia who are able to come to the festival. And it becomes the place where they can say things that sometimes they can't say everywhere <laughs> else in Indonesia. So it's, um, I hope someday you'll be able to come to Ubud and, and be uh, join that community as well. But I bring this up mostly because I want I'm going to try my best to find ways to bring this conversation to to that community to make it as relevant as possible to um, the the Indonesian audience. Even though in my head I'm here in <laughs> California and and uh, and you're in in Oregon. Um, but so speaking of which, first I just wanted to start with how are you doing? <laughs> uh, thanks for that. I'm I'm doing good. I'm doing relatively well. I mean, I suppose everyone's. Uh... Uh, suffering to some or some degree or other in relationship to the virus. But, uh, you know, as good as you can, as good as I can anyway. I, I spend a lot of time inside in the drawing table anyway. Mm -hmm. So my life isn't circumscribed in quite the same way other people's lives are. And you have community and family <laughs> um, in your area, activist communities uh, that are... You know... I'd say the activist communities I know or the, or, or the people I know are sort of spread around the world. Uh -huh. um, it, it's not necessarily a Portland based community that I, that I spend time with, but uh, you know, you just keep in touch with the people you've met in your travels. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. I, I live in a co-housing community, so it kind of didn't hit us the same way as everybody else because we have all these families that are all together already. Um, but I think for, uh, you know, the, one of the hardest things is the isolation for a lot of people, even for an introvert like myself, I, you know, yeah. at some point you want to, you know, you need to engage and it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad, I'm glad you're, you're able to find that <laughs> as well. Um, so I was going to start with this sort of getting out of the way. I'm not actually a big comics person. Um, I didn't, not that I have a problem with that. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about how, how graphic novels have become this thing and, you know, and I've been able to win awards and recognized as literature and all that stuff. But it's just, I'm, I'm not an expert <laughs> in the area. I'm in a very, very, you know, just didn't grow up reading a lot of them. Um, 
and I think I, we're sort of paired up because, um, you know, I write children's books about social justice issues and issues, and you're doing what's, you know, genre bending, seen, seen as genre bending kind of, of work. Um, and so I guess my question is, do you, my, my audience is children. Do you see your, and I think in some ways graphic novels, have, are there's this tension where you know a lot of people see them as for kids but you actually am i right that you don't really see it as writing for kids or do you see it as skewing to a younger audience or some in some ways real you know relating to the kind a, a different audience than what traditional journalism would well um i guess i do think of what i do as for adults um, I do think that there are a lot of, you know, basically high school age and up, um, and that goes all the way to, to old age. Um, I think there's an important place. <clears throat> Comics for children is an important um, topic that often gets left aside because comics have now become so much for adults. We think of them for, for adults that uh, we forget that, you know, like for, uh, you know, I grew up reading comics. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I guess, you know, if I had to think of my audience, I always think of myself. And when I started out uh, doing my, my, my journalistic work, um, I searched around for anything that would really respond to some other need I had in any form of literature, which is something that engages really directly with the world. And I found there was little that did that. Um, there were satirical publications. There were the, the underground comics in America, which, which you did. Um, but I wanted, because I studied, I studied journalism, I wanted something that was much more about how the world really is. And so um, I always sort of, ultimately, my primary audience was kind of myself. I had to sort of amuse myself with my work or entertain myself or educate myself. And all my books have been sort of that it's basically allowing everyone to see that my process of self-education because I don't come to um, the world as a fully formed theoretical, you know, activist who's always going to think in the correct way or whatever. I go, I find things and then things become sort of clear to me and my relationship with those things becomes um, sort of... Uh, enriched by the experiences themselves. And then I begin to sort things out, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, does it feel clear though? Or because I actually, one of the things I appreciate about a lot of the work that you do is that you'll, you know, you'll present one perspective and then you'll almost counter it right there, um, you know, with your own doubts, like the fact that you don't mask, you know, you don't claim easy victories, and, you know, that whole idea of being able to hold these contradictions in some ways is what keeps it from feeling didactic. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Um, it's important for me to, to recognize, I, I never really think of myself quite as an, I don't think of myself as an activist. I think of myself as a journalist and I, and I often when I'm around activists, I feel like we have the same goals. Like I, I think we even share the same politics, but um, I always have to allow myself to see things I sort of don't want to see uh, in the sense that they might go against what my preconceived notions are and to sort of let them inhabit the work too. And, you know, the world is full of contradictions and so it's important for me to recognize those things. But I don't come from, I also do not come from that standard objective style journalism that uh, pretends, I think, that um, there are two sides of every story and we have to balance. And that's all, that's all, you know, we're obligated to do is to show, well, this person said that, that person said that. And now it's up to the reader to, they've got all the information they need, which I think is very bogus way of thinking about the world because you're in many situations where you realize, oh, there is an oppressor and there is an oppressed. The oppressed might not be angels, but that, that equation still exists, oppressor, oppressed. It's complicated. Sometimes it's turned around, 
Um, but, you know, journalism to me is sort of the reconnaissance, um, going out and really finding out what's going on. Yeah, I think the difficulty for people who are activists, you know, who see ourselves as being part of particular campaigns is that there's a, a narrative that if you air the dirty laundry part of it, feels like it can play to the other side. And, um, and so even though, like, you know, at home, we, we are comfortable talking about the problems with it. But when we're putting out a story or putting out this narrative, there's a, a, sort of a need to, to maintain a particular storyline that doesn't give ammunition to the other side. And I think um, somehow that's in, in terms of the thing that I get a lot is this question of indoctrination, like, or, you know, what you're doing is that propaganda or indoctrination for kids kind of thing and sort of how to, to be able to be honest about the storytelling that we're doing, not pretending that there, are, there is no dirty laundry, um, you know, masking difficulties and all that, but also, but at the same time, there is a line you can cross where you're helping the other side, right? Um, and do you, I guess, do you ever worry about that? Or is it, is there a method for how, how far you go to sort of balance, not, not looking for objectivity type balance, but balance in terms of like, like trying to make sure that, uh, you know, you're not feeding something that is actually problematic or unanswered? Well, I think <clears throat> that's a good question. And I feel like if you see one or two things that feel like the exception, uh, then you say, well, that's an exception to bring it up. It doesn't really have a place because the overall picture is such and such. But sometimes you see things that are more endemic that I guess people would think of as dirty laundry. Uh, for example, uh, this new book I have, Paying the Land, takes place in Canada. When I, and when I went there, activists sort of told me, well, be very careful about these particular issues. Don't bring them up. And, you know, no journalist ever wants to hear that. But I, had, I was very cautious. But, and those issues were coming up anyway. They were in the room all the time. They were kind of the elephants in the room. And people would, would engage me about those issues. And I realized, well, actually, it's, no, it's not a secret that there's alcoholism in, within the indigenous communities there. That's, they talk about it openly. They're always, they, people talk to me about being sober for such and such a period of time or whatever. The important thing to me, you, you mentioned the word honesty and you have to be honest about what you're seeing. But I think what you also have to do is relate that those problems like alcoholism, for example, with colonialism, how does it all fit in? And then you can get into things like how those communities have been um, atomized very purposefully by the Canadian government, which took children away from their families and flew them to different places, wouldn't let them speak their own languages, beat them when they did, regimented them, Christianized them. And when they came back to their communities, they couldn't even speak sometimes with their, with their grandparents or parents because they no longer shared the same, literally shared the same language. So this is, <clears throat> this leads to problems like alcoholism. You can, you, you have to understand why there are these issues and these, this dirty laundry sort of exists. There are reasons behind it. And I think it's never a good idea to um, hide those sorts of things, the, if they are issues, if they are important issues. Because I think in that, you, you begin to, make your what you're trying to do sort of or your activism if it, that's the case um less believable i think a lot of people understand that we're humans and that there are problems in each community we all have our own problems um you you don't want to sort of leave those out of the equation if they are part of the equation i think yeah, yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, because yeah, I think the, the struggle as people who care about these things and who try to support activism is this sort of like 
towing that line between trying to, you know, the way I see things, you know, I want to hear the complexity, but I understand that when, when it's actually a campaign that I'm involved in, I find myself pulling back <laughs> a lot more and wanting to, so in some ways, as for my children's books in particular, it's been helpful that I have a little bit stepped away from day-to-day -day, um, organizing type work. Um, you know, I have lots of people in my community, but uh, um, it, it requires not being as invested <laughs> to be able to be honest. And in some ways, I think it's actually more helpful or hopefully, you know. Um, so the, another question that sort of comes, this may or may not be one that is that relevant to how you think of things. But for me, with the with the kids as the audience, the, another question that comes up a lot is this question of trauma and how to talk about things in a way that, you know, are you reintroducing trauma, reliving trauma? For the kids, it's like how to talk about difficult issues for with younger people and what's age appropriate in order to, you know, and, and how, what sort of story arcs do you need to be able to have to introduce into this so that it doesn't just leave you, you know, empty and depressed? Um, do you feel like for your audience and age level that there's any sort of, I don't want to say like responsibility <laughs> to try to be able to tell that story in a way that that isn't just, that doesn't leave people with the trauma side of it. Um, I don't want to say too much about it, but what, how do you think about mm -hmm. that part of it? And also, I mean, you're talking to a lot of people and 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 maybe your audience isn't always just Americans who don't know anything about Palestine, but uh, you know, people who are living through it, who have lived through it are gonna relive it as they read your books. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, and that's a, that's a very complex question. Um, I always, I sort of fall back on myself. Like uh, I'm not one to enjoy looking at uh, violence in movies, in documentaries. Um, there, there are things that are filmed that I have such a hard time looking at. Yeah, especially uh, people, these days. Yeah. yeah. You see things uh, sometimes that are filmed and you think, I, I cannot, I, I just cannot look at it. I think the advantage with drawing is it allows people to look because it because people know there's a filter there. The filter is the artistic hand. It doesn't mean that there isn't trauma there or that you might pick up on some of that trauma, but it's mediated uh, to some degree. And I think it'll the drawings sort of allow people to look where a photograph or film might be too much sometimes because I they can be too much for me. And I always sort of use myself as a reference, you know, man is the measure of all things. It's a very sort of self-centered approach. But I think if, if this is, if I'm drawing something, I think this is sort of too much for me, for my stomach, then I feel like maybe it's too much for the average reader's stomach. Cause I think my sensibilities are kind of ordinary. I don't, I don't enjoy violence, but I, um, I don't even enjoy depicting violence, but, but I think, you know, when you're drawing, you have to be really cognizant of the fact that you can always draw the worst moment. It's seldom that you can get a photograph of the very worst moment, for example, but you can always mm. draw the mortal moment. Sure. And you realize you can actually beat a reader over the head with that sort of thing and, and numb them or just really turn them off. And to me, it's very important that, that the reader is, remains engaged with the work and is willing to turn the page. So I sort of, I have to be careful about what I show because I, I don't want to be turned off by what I'm drawing and I don't want the reader to be turned off, but the work I'm doing often does involve depicting violence. And you also have to be honest to the material. So that balance is something maybe I've learned over time. I hope it might not be, it might not satisfy some people, it, but it, it satisfies my own my own inclinations as far as it goes. How is it that you're not numb? <laughs> You've been to you know, to all these conflict areas. I mean, I sort of have this image as like you're in a way, you know, there, there's this sort of like, you know, war junkie journalist type, type thing. You don't come across that way. I've watched your interviews I've, <laughs> and talking to you, but 
somehow or another you're you are still going to all these places and hearing all these these very difficult stories and then needing to come back and imagine them yeah and you know i mean strangely when i'm when i'm in the field as a journalist talking to people i'm i'm kind of i'm very clinical and professional so i'm hearing things that are really hair raising sometimes um and recording them and to me the important thing is to get down the information correctly and to keep the person i'm speaking to on a good enough track so that we're actually getting the information out in some ways it's harder when i'm drawing in, in fact it is harder when i'm drawing because then i have to stop being the 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 clinician and the technician and be the person who's trying to understand what that person, what the interview subject was going through at that moment. Then the artist comes out and you're, you are dealing with real human feelings and emotions and trying to get them across. So that has been more difficult. And yeah, over time, I'd say for the first 20 years I was doing this, I could pretty much get by, but it, it started to sink in a little more. So um, this might sound a bit strange, but I, I, I've tried to get away from conflict journalism. Um, I didn't want to draw the AK-47 anymore. I didn't want to. I didn't want to draw violence, and it was one of the reasons I did this book, Paying the Land, to go up to Canada and to to do this story, because I thought, well, it's resource extraction. It's indigenous people. It's a different kind of thing. But then, of course, I discover there's tremendous violence that was done to indigenous people. <laughs> It just wasn't by guns or a cavalry charge up there. It was schools. Schools, I mean, nuns, teachers were, priests were beating people. And the students were traumatized. They were sexually abused. Um, they were abused in many, many different ways. And so you realize you, you really cannot get away from some forms of, forms of violence, it seems. Um, if you're engaging with the world Unfortunately, you realize that there are power dynamics that to keep people, some people down, it's not just a matter of convincing them. Maybe in our society, in the West, let's say in the West, I should say, we are, we are sort of take our places and accept it because that's the way it is and we're nice and we're moderate and all that and we get screwed over. In other places, it doesn't quite work in the same way where people struggle and the consequences of that struggle is it can be pretty brutal. And um, again, it's like you can think you're getting away from conflict, but you're not. So I, I that it was a still a hard book to do. But I recognize that that's just that's just maybe my role. That's what I I can try. Those are my abilities to try to filter those things enough that you don't lose the edge of of those stories but you were also not making debilitating a reader and thinking oh well, well then what's the hope of anything or what's the use of anything right, right i'm sure you must wrestle with this sort of thing too and i think for you it must be even more even more nuanced because you're you're you you your the audience is is a younger audience yeah i mean and that question comes a lot for me in terms of you know <laughs> how how to not you know we want to talk about difficult things kids all over the world grow up with difficult stories in their lives they know you know depend you know there's sort of this this privilege that certain demographics of people in the west are able to say you want to keep your kids innocent and so you have this childhood that's all innocent you don't talk about anything bad kind of thing but that's not true you know if you're of a demographic where the police may shoot you um, just for, um, you know, traffic stop, or if you're uh, you have family who might get deported at any time, you need to know what's going on, and 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 especially for the Indonesian audience, and you know, we grew up in Indonesia. Uh, I grew up under the Soeharto dictatorship, and we, you know, are fully aware of the consequences of saying certain things and why it's important to so knowing that that there's danger out there is not is something that is not um 
is is not unique for kids around the world but i but for me the question is what are we telling them what is you know i, I always say my books are really about agency so it's about the fact you know at the end of the day it's about there is something you can do about it. You can, we can't promise a happy ending. We can't promise that it will always work, but um, these are not unaddressable problems. And there's, uh, there, it's not that there are, there's nothing that you can do as a person, you know, with all the different skills that you might bring to the world kind of thing. So in a way that's an agenda that I have, right? That I'm, that I, I do look at my books and say, am I, am I telling a story that, that at the end of the day, Again, not happy ending, but <laughs> that you know that sort of enhances the idea that there that uh, you have agency in this world, kind of thing. Um, I feel like you're a, a little less required to have that explicit of an agenda. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I to me, I, I I'm trying to just get information across. Um, uh, for myself, I think like. Uh, Sometimes I'll get into a pessimistic frame of mind about the way the world is, but what I try not to be pessimistic is 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 the individual agency try to do the right thing kind of no matter what. And to me, sometimes the right thing is going to talk to people, um, finding out their stories, finding out what reality is, and letting people know, especially people who might be directly connected to it somehow by their taxpayer dollars or whatever it is. So to me, the idea is sort of to do the good work and let the good work sort of decide for itself how it's going to play out in people's minds and if it has an effect or not. If I had to think too much about effect, I would probably get depressed. I just have to think about let, let, things, let things play out. You, you've done what you could. Let them play out now because you, you don't want to get too – because I think you debilitate yourself sometimes if you think – if I do this, then this is going to happen. Sure, yeah. And you have to think, I do this because it's the right thing to do, and maybe something will happen, you know, right. because I did that. Or because I'm joined with people doing that. Right. And because just rolling up in a ball in the corner is um, unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask you about... about um, representation you sort of talked a bit about you know a lot of what you do is gathering information you i was curious a bit about your methodology i don't know if you record interviews or if you take notes but you eventually take people's words and um put them in the mouths of the drawings and you're representing them and and um and it's often not you know necessarily you're talking about people whose experience is not yours, right? So there's a big movement in the kids' book world around sort of this own voices and, you know, the question of authenticity of voices, um, which isn't to say that nobody should ever write, write about somebody who is not themselves, but, and you are inserted in this, but you are still writing about uh, your other people in a way that I guess it's, non-fiction so you're reporting but and, and on some level you're still you're you're imagining their um intentions and oftentimes things that have happened in the past that you weren't there for you're you are you, you know you're still it's still a creative um imagining of a situation how do you sort of think about that you know, like how do you balance that or how do you how do you your responsibility as somebody who is not that person representing them um, in the broader sort of cultural appropriation question, I guess. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I don't think journalists think too much about cultural appropriation. I you know, I think our, our, the idea is to go and get the voices of people. And to me, it's not a question of giving voice to the voiceless because I find that a really the wrong configuration. Sure. To me, it's like listening to people and they already have a voice, you know? So to me, it's, it's just a matter of writing down accurately what they're telling me and trying to get their stories accurately because people should hear them, you know, people should hear these stories. We should open our ears to those stories, I guess. Um, 
so I don't quite think of it in terms of I'm appropriating someone's story. To me, it's a, I'm sitting down with someone, they know what I'm doing. They know I'm getting their story or getting some information about something that happened to them. It's important for me to recognize that there's a, there's a tension that exists between sort of the accuracy I, I, I hold myself to when I'm with, let's, in regard to the quotes, and then the drawings, which are clearly subjective. I'm, I am interpreting someone else's experience. Now, the way I try to do that to satisfy myself um, is to ask a lot of visual questions when I'm uh, talking to people and to do a lot of visual research. Um, in some cases, for example, in Paying the Land, I'm, I'm, it starts out with a story about growing up life in the bush in the 50s. People don't really live in the bush anymore in, in, in this part of Canada. Uh, or I, I, perhaps not even anywhere in Canada at this point. So how, how to reconstruct this? Well, there are photo archives. Um, there is video of people that you can find online of people making a moose skin boat, for example. And ultimately what I did with those chapters, because I was kind of worried about depicting people's very, you know, very cultural, culturally specific things. I, I sent these pages uh, to people in the Northwest Territories and eventually it ended up in the hands of the person who the story was about and he approved it. So that that's good, right? I mean, that's obviously, I, I don't often go to those lengths because sometimes it's not possible to go to quite those lengths. But what I try to do is walk the same ground if possible and yeah, if you if you heard, if you saw my interview transcripts, I'm often asking questions that a, a a you know a standard journalist wouldn't wouldn't ask about. Like if someone says they ran across the field, in my head I'm thinking, hmm, is that an empty field or is it a field with trees? Or, you, know, you have <laughs> right. to think these terms. You got to dry it, yeah. Yeah, but there's always going to be a tension between what I think is sort of the journalistic standard of accuracy with the quotes and the drawings, which are, you know. You have to say it's like a director making a film. That person is casting, you know, making the co there's a someone's designing the costumes and making the set and putting the extras in. That's also out of, you know, it's informed. It's sort of a informed subjectivity. Let's say that the drawings. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wasn't meaning to accuse you of a cultural oh, no, appropriation. No, no, no. I, was, I was more, you know, but that was sort of what is the method, you know, like I, I do the same thing, right? There's a lot of things, you know, I do a lot of, I, I, you know, when I can, I do work with the folks that I'm depicting and try to make sure I get sign offs and all that kind of stuff. You know, nowadays, a lot of people use these sensitivity readers and this kind of thing, you know, so I think, yeah, just sort of like, I think it's important to be, um, thoughtful about these things things and and not yeah. sort of assume that you have you know you can you know look it up on the internet and then know how to you know represent people and i, I know your your I, I, your method is so much more um, in depth than that but it's a very fair question though and it's one that you know you definitely have to think about i recognize that people are handing me things that um are can be very sensitive and i have to be aware of that and it's not to say I don't make mistakes along the way, um, but I, I do my best not to, let's say that. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to get, I got some questions from various friends in Indonesia. Um, one of them is uh, this guy, uh, Mas Hikmat Dermawan. He's an Indonesian writer, journalist, um, and um, community activist, works a lot in cultural critic world and and um, comics, is really, and, and written a number of books on co comic criticism and stuff. And, you know, when I brought up that I was going to be talking to him, to, to you, he was really excited. And I was like, I actually wrote a whole thing about <laughs> Josako and Tempo magazine. So I, I asked him what questions he would ask for you. So I'm going to ask you a couple um, that he pr gave me, since we don't have an audience Q&A. Um, one of them is he asks about uh, the Great War, um, the piece that you did in 2013 that is a big fold out about the Battle of the Somme. Um, and 
you said that you had noted in an interview that you want to, to think deeply about something that still clouds your vision of humanity. Um, so his question was, what is your vision of humanity and is it still clouded? <laughs> I would imagine that it's going to be clouded till the day I die. <laughs> you know, to me, it's the question that there are just questions that are open that you never quite answer. And I, I read a lot of different things about, let's say, the, the question of human nature, what's determined and what isn't. And I go back and forth on the issue. Um, I, some of, some of my work, um, I have something on the drawing table now that's trying to answer some questions. And again, I think I'll never get, I'll never really get quite to the bottom of, of them, but it's a question about how crowds behave. Uh, it's a story that I actually don't really have the, uh, how would I put it? I, I'm not in the right mood to do the story right now because uh, I'm at one of those points where I kind of need something else in my life. But uh, it's about a riot that took place in India and it's uh, it's kind of a brutal book. Maybe that's why I'm trying to I'm I'm sort of avoiding it now. I've done all the field work, um, but it's trying to get to what people tell themselves about an event about a year afterwards. How do they reconcile what happened in their own minds? And do they tell themselves stories? Do they do myth? How how do myths develop? Basically, so over time. I think my journalistic work has, has led me not just to look at, well, this, this is happening because these, this people and that people are fighting over the same land and on this date this happened. And I mean, that's part of journalism and history, but there are other things that are going on that uh, I'm over time I've, I've needed to answer. I probably will never quite answer, but I think Though that's the question now I'm asking myself, the ones your your friends raised, and they're they're good questions. Yeah, I think um, there's many of these stories in Indonesia. <laughs> um, have you been to Indonesia? No, I haven't. I haven't. So, I, mean, I, 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 think... I know very little about Indonesian history. What happened in the '60s, of course, with the communists, right. and during the war with the Dutch, and, and yeah, yeah, and I mean, interestingly. Um, 98, you know, the overthrow of Soeharto regime, there was outbreaks of violence in different parts of Indonesia that um, there's a lot of debate over how much this is somehow natural versus manipulated. I uh, know you've talked about sort of how much crowds can be manipulated and how much the military had any sort of hand in this or other forces um, and that kind of thing. And I think um, one of the uh, people that I met at the Ubud Writers Festival a couple of years ago is Rani Pramesti. <clears throat> she wrote, she did a, it's not a graphic novel because it's not printed on paper, um, but she had worked with an illustrator, Cindy Sadia, who, and, and did a whole piece about the May 98 riots in Jakarta that, that resulted in um, uh, rapes of Chinese Indonesian women who were, you know, and it's, it's a long story, but if you ever look at it, it's called the Chinese whispers. Um, but that, what's interesting is she also chose a medium that's, you know, that was sort of graphic novel-esque, although it's online rather than, than on paper. Um, and it sort of connects to the question I was asking a lot of people in Indonesia when I was, because I now I've lived in the United States for 30 years, is, you know, there's all these sort of taboo subjects, things that you can't talk about in Indonesia um, and without getting in trouble. And yet at the Ubud Writers Festival, there's all these people who are, who are talking about those subjects. Um, and the question of sort of like, how do you know what you can and can't talk about and where, you know, where is the line? Um, and one of the people that um, I remember talking to is this woman, Aprila Wayar, who's Papuan, and she writes about Papua, and it's another place where a lot of violence, a lot of conflict, and the question of how to, why she can talk about it, and her answer is because she's writing fiction, even though almost everything in that is, is nonfiction, it's, she's talking about real events, but 
in in the framework of fiction, she's allowed to talk about that. She's also a journalist, and as a journalist, she can't write about these things. Um, and so, I guess, is there one of the questions that came up with um, was, was a bunch of the Indonesians I was talking to was sort of like the question of fear and how do you know where and when you can say certain things? Is this anything? you ever have to struggle with as an author based in the United States talking about these things? Do you, is there, are there people who might be endangered by, um, or anything like that, that you have to struggle with? You mean people who are endangered in their communities because of what I've said? Or, yeah, or, or, your, or yourself, or, you know, yeah, any, any well, all I mean, of that, I guess. When, uh, when I'm interviewing people, Sometimes they will say something like, uh, I don't want to be identified or no, you cannot take a photograph. And then I try to come up with something that a representation for them and a certain amount of anonymity to um, respect that. So I try to be careful in that regard. As far as myself, no, I don't feel, I don't, anything I feel, let's just say this, anything I feel about restrictions on myself just pales in comparison to the things you're describing and to things I know that go on around the world. I mean, in America, our, our greatest censor in a way for journalists or for people who write is our probably ourselves and our ignorance. Really, we often don't even know about things. We haven't explored certain information. When, when people really do threaten a Western state, let's say like Julian Assange or Chelsea Manning or Edward Snowden, we, we can see the result. So if there's a, a, let's say a truth teller in the Western context who is actually getting to the heart of something really that is going to, that is going to threaten a regime or threaten the whole edifice or the facade of a regime, then we'll know it because then they will really go after those people hammer and tong. And what's really sad and sickening for me is that the American media won't respond to that. That so, so many mainstream journalists here are rewarded um, by access to power and don't seem to really care about someone like Julian Assange. Um, so, if you're really a threat, if you're a true threat to a regime, you, then you're in trouble no matter where you are. But there are very few journalists in the West that you could say are real threats to any sort of regime. That makes sense. Yeah, um, getting back to, uh, there was a podcast um, with um, Leila Hudori and um, who, who's a, a journalist and author in Indonesia, and she does this book talk with uh, podcasts, and she had a, on her, as a guest um, Arif Zulkifli, who is, was a, the editor, editor of Tempo magazine, and um, he had picked your book, um, the uh, footnotes, um, Palestine, as um, sort of the book that he wanted to talk about. And what I thought was interesting, one of the questions that they were talking about was, um, your depiction of yourself in in your books, and they were assuming that you were on purpose not having that person be you. Um, but I've I've seen your drawings of that character throughout a number of your books, and my sense is that is supposed to be you. Is that how you see yourself? Well, I mean, yeah, that's that's me, and um, that has to do with the fact that when I started doing my journalistic work, because I'd never studied art, I always drew in a very cartoony fashion. Um, so everything had a very cartoony look. But as I, I realized over time that if you're going to have a pretense towards journalism, you need to draw more representationally, I thought. So I tried to move everything to be more realistic as far as how I drew, drew people and things. I just left myself out of that equation. I, I didn't, I sort of kept myself cartoony accidentally i did not think it through i wasn't even paying in other words i was not paying attention so over time people start to say oh how come you still draw yourself in that 
weird cartoony way where everything else looks more realistic. And I have no answer for that because I, it was, <laughs> there was no reason for it. I've been told it's good to have a more nondescript character because then a reader can project themselves into that character. Maybe true, but it's not really the reason I did it. But I, I have myself as a character in my work because I always want to show that this is seen through um, my eyes, through the eyes of someone who comes in with his own prejudices and preconceived notions. That journalism isn't, you know, written by someone who knows all, all seeing, all knowing, objective, you know, to a fault. It's 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 done by very um, imperfect people who are negotiating with people they don't know, uh, you know, to get a, to get a story. And it's, it's sometimes, it's also interesting to show that negotiation to show how, how you are the other in their communities and how that works, what it's like to have a Westerner for them, how they treat that person. I mean, all that's sort of pretty interesting, often the sort of things that journalists write out of their stories, but I think help create a fuller picture. Are, are you strict about um, the stories being actual experiences and conversations you've had, or do you ever illustrate, you know, through s something that you actually have created fiction? Do you ever mix kind of fictionalized pieces in any of this or? No, no, I, yeah. I, I can't do that. Um, Sometimes my drawings will, like someone um, in, in the book Paying the Land mentioned how they were told they would rot it, they would be burning in hell for eternity if they sinned. So I depicted hell in a way I wanted to depict hell. But that, right. that's sort of going along with what that person was telling me. It's important for me to be accurate. That's why it was interesting when you mentioned the Papuan journalist who's writing fiction. Um, I, I totally understand that because what I think journalism do does is sort of put down a series of dots but journalistically, sometimes you cannot connect those dots. You know in your heart what's going on, but you cannot journalistically prove it. Whereas mm -hmm. a fiction writer, especially someone who's a journalist, can connect those dots. They, they, you know, you're around, sometimes you're around places and you, you sort of know what's going on, but you just can't get it journalistically. Mm -hmm. Answers, I might, you know, most of my books that are stories were always... Um, memoirs like they're just talking about the actual experience i had had and then sort of background kind of thing but um m is for movement which is my middle grade early middle grade book i actually consciously i just my stories weren't an interesting enough <laughs> and didn't all connect enough to the to, to the broader story i was, wanted to tell so i actually you know and i acknowledged it in the beginning that this is not a true story the, you know whereas my other ones were er, but you know a lot of it started with true stories um but then you know it's not just that i changed the names of the to protect the innocent but i actually did change some of the outcomes and some of the actual old stories um so i was just curious if that was something that you ever could do but i think because your framework is very much more journalism um you're you probably yeah do have to be much more strict about that but but that doesn't mean that i haven't worked on things that are clearly fiction I see. That are meant to, because I, I have done smaller projects. I did a comic called Bump, which was about um, surveillance. And it's, it's sort of like a science fiction <laughs> book. Uh -huh. but, uh, it's, it's pretty satirical, pretty wild. I had to express something else creatively. I didn't, I didn't necessarily want to do a journalistic book about something I just had this very gut angry feeling about. So I, I can I'll try other things too, but when I'm when I'm doing when I'm on the journalistic path, I try to stick to it. Right, that makes sense. Um, speaking of your other books, are, is there any particular book or set of books that you feel are underappreciated? Well, that one, Bump, yeah. it sold terribly, terribly. Because <laughs> you know, people, I, I'm you, you might experience this yourself as a writer i think all writers feel this once once they get out of that which is well trodden by themselves and everyone sort of expects then you have to be, it has to be quite something powerful and good and 
beyond the you know uh beyond the usual that that's going to actually grab their attention because they usually kind of want to see you do what you do best okay, right i don't know if you've ever experienced that but uh yeah yeah no it's funny i mean the the book that you know that i consider sort of my best book is the least selling <laughs> but <laughs> um but you know they always ask you what's your favorite book and that kind of thing like, you sorry. needed to do it you needed to yeah. do it and it was important yeah, yeah. that's that's how i feel about some of my work too yeah no and i i was fortunate to be able to um your i was looking at your newest book it's paying the land for people who um are out there in the internet land you should get this um <laughs> It's a beautiful book. It's hardcover. It's a thirty-dollar book. You come out of um, underground comics. Do you feel like is it, how do you stay connected to sort of the the that kind of aesthetic and that kind of um, access question around? Because I have I similarly, you know, kind of these books. I just feel like this is too expensive. I would never buy it when I was a kid, kind of thing. How? It, but I mean, these are deserved to be, and your New York Times bestseller. And so this is, I understand why they're doing it like this, but do you ever feel like there's something you need to do in particular? Or is there a way that you kind of stay connected to the, to the more grassroots scene around this? That's a good question. I mean, it's a question that actually troubles me a fair amount because um, in some ways, I think the, the graphic novel, um, which I like to, I just like simply to call comic books. The the graphic novel um, has, in in moving towards an adult audience, in getting into bookstores, in getting even featured in a great festival like this one, um, in being taken seriously, all that is really good. I mean, it's it's a way of you can make a living. You really it was very 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 difficult to make a living when we had, you know, the old floppy comic books. But there is part of me that um, feels that, I don't know how to put it exactly, maybe it's the wrong word, but the, the, the form has been sort of gentrified a little. And mm -hmm. now we're all doing these books that are um, meant to be taken really, really seriously. And of course they are, but there's that side of me that just wants to wade into the mud and just really appreciates that old underground aesthetic where kind of anything goes. And so, for example, that's one of the reasons I did the book Bump I mentioned. I needed to do something like that. I needed it, it for to be soft cover and to be as cheap as possible and to be on sort of a cheaper paper, not, not so cheap that it looked awful, but make it relatively affordable. I mean, forgive me, but something you could sort of take into the, into the bathroom with you and read it when you're sitting on the toilet, mm. you know, that, I want something like that to do because I, I love that feeling of something that mm, that isn't quite throwaway, but isn't sort of an object. Unfortunately, in the book trade now, it's it's the objects that have some value and can sell and can make you a living. But I'm working on a, a book now that's uh, quite underground in its aesthetic. It'll probably be an object in some ways, but it it's very, very different from anything I've done really trying to be um get back to those underground roots and letting myself go a little because i think it's important it probably will help my more journalistic work it's it's also it's definitely freed up my cartooning hand uh -huh. which is to draw that in that funny way again you know it's really helped yeah and i think You've had enough success that you should be able to do both. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to. I want to. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of in Indonesia there is a really vibrant sort of graphic arts community, graphic, you know, comics community. Um, I again, I'm not super connected to it myself, but you know, having when I went to my family was living in Jogja and the, you know we went there's some even you know they were doing galleries there people are putting on very you know and this is all very kind of um low budget you know uh, sort of 
down to earth <laughs> grassroots arts and and politics stuff, and it's often very connected with with uh, political activism and all that. Is there? I guess is there any? The question I was sort of asked is like, what would you say to Indonesian um, graphic artists, graphic novelists? Um, any sort of thoughts you, I know this is a hard sort of generalized question, but um, yeah, it's sort of that you would share from your experience. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm sorry I can't be there in person to meet the people you're talking about and to see their work and to hear what they have to say to hear what they think of their art, what, what, it, what they feel it's for, and to hear about their problems. I think comics anywhere, even where I am, even in my situation, believe it or not, it's sort of not a guarantee that things are going to be good in a couple of months. Comics is a hard, it's a hard um, uh, road to, to hoe. It really is. Um, comics take time. And they take a lot of effort. And so you really have to want to do it, I think. And I, I just encourage people to continue uh, with what they're doing, especially if they feel like it's having some impact. I mean, if they're doing even, even something that's uh, stapled or whatever it is, or printed on cheap paper, but if it's getting out there um, and if it's about reality and what people are going through, I think people are gonna respond to it They'll, they'll respond to it. And I think, you know, the artists there know their reality. And I don't think they should shy away, shy away from their reality. Their reality is interesting. And I would like them, I would like them to continue because I'd like to read that work and find out about the reality through those cartoonists. Yeah, I think, you know, printing and distribution and all that kind of stuff is, is always a big challenge. You know, people, you know, the underground aesthetic comes out of people doing a lot of DIY stuff, but, that always is difficult up against, you know, capitalism. And so the um, the internet has created some openings um, for what that, that's worth. Um, are there any sort of new interesting ways that people are doing things or movements around that are related? It doesn't have to be, you know, you sort of created a whole new genre of this comics journalism, you know, what, what should be be looking at? What are you looking at that you think is cool and exciting? Okay, well, first of all, don't look at me if you're looking for the new, because my, my <laughs> things is quite traditional. But I know, I know there are cartoonists who go out to demonstrations, for example, will draw something very quickly and post mm. it right away. Um, I'm a much slower, more reflective person who, who is thinking in terms of uh, something that is recording something now so it won't be it, it will not be timely but it might reflect on future events somehow but there's a lot going on there's a lot of web comics and um, things on instagram that every now and then someone passes my way I, i'm not i don't have my finger on that pulse so i think the the cartoonists in indonesia the younger cartoonists could probably tell me those things more than i could tell them those things <laughs> Cool. Yeah, there's, it, it's amazing. There's, you know, I met this guy, Ali Tambara, who does this Nobody Corp International. So he, he's a, a graphic artist. And, you know, he says he literally does things on his phone, <laughs> like illustration work on his phone. And you know, I could never do that. I can barely see what's on my phone. <laughs> um, it's amazing to me what people yeah. can do. I know people, um, it probably sounds really silly for me to be talking about things as if they're new and interesting but you know people looking at their computer and drawing on a pad and never using paper and i get it it's it's and i'm just amazed at what can be produced that way but, you know i'm just i'm an old guy who actually likes paper and likes the <laughs> and likes the scratching of a, a nib on a nib on paper you know so I'm an old dog. I appreciate that. I'm I'm almost as old as you are, but I actually do everything on a computer too. <laughs> um, I think our time's up. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your experiences and thoughts with the Kumbali audience. Um, I 
have a little closing thing I need to read, um, but is there anything else you want to add before we close out? I just want to say, you know, thanks to you, really, because you asked really good questions. I normally don't get questions sort of from an activist perspective, and I really appreciate that. And my best wishes to everyone there. Thank you. All right. Well, Pat <laughs> Josako. Kambali 20 was made possible with the support of the Yayasan Mudraswari Saraswati Patron Program and their donors. The Patron Program was created to seek assistance for the survival of both festivals and the foundation. By making a valuable contribution to the Yayasan Pat Patron Program, you will be directly involved in delivering both festivals in due time. Your contribution will guarantee the future of Indonesia's most meaningful cross-cultural platform of words, ideas, culture, and the creative arts. Follow at Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit ubudwritersfestival.com for more information about the patron program. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take care.